Hi everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Lauren Tostenson and I am in the Public Information Office with El Paso County. Thank you for joining us for our third installment of EPC Engage. Today we're focusing on wastewater systems all the way from the county level uh, to public health and up through CDPHE for the state. Um, we're very excited to have you with us. It's going to be a very informative presentation. I just have a couple of housekeeping notes for everyone. If this is your first time participating in a Teams live event, um, we are going to have a good amount of time for questions. We want this to be interactive since you guys have access to all the experts on this subject here today. Um, so if you can go ahead and look at the top right hand of your screen, there should be an icon with two message bubbles uh, with a question mark in it. That's the Q&A function. And anytime during the presentation that you think of a question that you want to ask, go ahead and submit it in the Q&A portion, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, again, you can submit them at any point. We will see them, and then we'll be able to get to those and have the experts answer them for you at the end. So um, jot those down as you're thinking of them. For now, for the first, uh, he's not a presenter, but he's going to kick us off today. Craig Dossie, our executive director of uh, El Paso County Planning and Community Development, is going to start us off, give you a little background on the EPC Engage series, and then hand it over to our presenters. So, Craig, go ahead and get us started. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're very excited to uh, do our presentation today regarding wastewater systems. There's a lot of a uh, lot of information here. Uh, obviously, when you, when you bring in state agencies as well as public health and then our own staff, there's a lot to cover. So uh, very excited to be able to provide this information um, and more importantly, to even provide the question and answer portion at the end. Um, this is, what is this, our third or fourth in the series so far, Lauren, uh, for EPC Engage, which is more of a technical track, um, trying to provide some of that information that's needed by the, the industry and others that are, are requesting permitting. Um, if you've missed any of the previous ones, I'd encourage you to go onto our website. Uh, there's a specific link on the Planning and Community Development Department website to EPC Engage. Uh, talks, there's several different ones out there that talk about permitting, talk about the engineering criteria manual, um, and there'll be upcoming events as well. Lauren, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so with regard to some of the upcoming events, uh, after the one today regarding wastewater systems, uh, then again, in May, we'll be talking about uh, water supply and the review process associated with water supply. Um, that will include representatives from uh, both the county attorney's office as well as the state water engineer's office. Um, both of those entities do review uh, uh, for water supply sufficiency, particularly with the subdivision process. Um, so we're really excited about that as well and, and really grateful that both state agencies are willing to, to <laughs> pun intended, engage uh, in this process. So really excited about that one coming up in May. And then in July, uh, as kind of keeping true to our every other month uh, schedule, we're going to do another one on residential site plans, uh, as well as some of the other permits that, that are submitted for and reviewed uh, at our front counter, uh, which is somewhat of a misnomer now. A lot of it's electronic. Um, and talking about the process there, uh, what, what you can expect from a timeline standpoint, um, but also in some ways kind of how to initiate those applications. Um, so look for those two events coming up in the next uh, two or three months. So with that, uh, we have four presenters today. I'm going to have each of the presenters when when they uh, start their, their portion of the presentation, just introduce themselves really quickly. Uh, but for your reference, uh, here are the four folks that are going to be speaking today. Uh, the two from our office are Petra Rangel, um, she handles a lot of the, the permitting at the front counter, um, specifically with regard to septic systems, but also some of the site development plans. So you'll see her again in July. And then Carrie Parsons in our office uh, is one of our planners. Uh, she handles a lot of the, the permitting in the county side of new uh, centralized wastewater treatment uh, systems with, with larger scale developments. Um, so with that, if we can move on to the next slide, we'll turn it over to Cat with a uh, presentation for public health. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. Um, as Craig said, my name is Kat McGarvey. I am the Water Quality Program Manager here at El Paso County Public Health. Um, I've been in this role for 
a little over a year now, um, right before the pandemic hit us and then um, took on a lot of extra duties while we were still maintaining our permitting permitting process for on-site wastewater treatment systems. Um, I have been with El Paso County for about eight years now um, in public health for a little over 10 years in total. So uh, many of those years have been spent in water and wastewater systems. So that is truly where my expertise lies. Uh, with on-site wastewater treatment systems, a little background, we are really trying to move from the use of septic as the terminology that we are using to describe these systems or, or label these systems to OWTS or on-site wastewater treatment systems. And the reason for that is we've moved from a disposal mentality uh, put it in the ground and forget it to treatment and we really want to focus on the treatment component of these when we are doing our reviews for our permitting because that effluent and that gray water or black water eventually makes its way back into the groundwater system and many of these on-site wastewater treatment systems actually are in areas where wells are also very prevalent as well and typically well water is not necessarily treated especially if it's on a residential lot prior to being consumed so whatever we are putting into the ground is then being pulled back out and consumed again by multiple um, individuals or people or animals and so we want to try to make that as safe as possible when we can when we can do that uh, so the basics for on-site wastewater treatment systems uh, We'll just say OWTS to make it efficient. OWTS, which are subject to local regulations, are those systems which are designed for less than 2,000 gallons per day of flow, meaning essentially you're putting less than 2,000 gallons per day into that water or into that system. Uh, single family, they typically are single family residential homes, auxiliary buildings on residential lots, so um, a barn or a shed or a workshop with a bathroom in it that's designed for the occupants of that property. Um, we do permit commercial systems at less than 2,000 gallons per day and then multifamily dwellings. So more than one single family residence connected into a system. Those systems that are, are, exceed that 2,000 gallon per day capacity limit are re regulated by the state or Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And we have a speaker from there today that'll go into those a little bit more. Next slide, Lauren. So, there we go. Um, when can I install an OWTS? So, land use code would require that your lot size be a minimum of two and a half acres to accommodate an on site wastewater treatment system. Uh, if there are existing lots and there are areas in El Paso County that have lots that are much smaller than two and a half acres, we can still try to get creative and, and permit on-site systems for those. It may require an extensive variance process to do that, um, but essentially lots that are smaller than two and a half acres that are currently existing, um, if they can meet the setbacks that are required as the, a function of the regulations, then we will certainly uh, be able to issue a permit. Um, any new lots or in new developments have to have that minimum two and a half acres, so not necessarily a, a large concern for that. Um, the other piece of that is for us to be able to issue a permit, a central or a, sanita a sanitation district main must not exist within 400 feet of any part of that property. So even if you've got a, a sanitation district main within 400 feet of any corner of your property or any lot line of that property, um, and that district will permit you to connect. There is a requirement in the regs to connect to that district. Um, so a couple of things that would prevent installation of an OWTS. Um, again, that sanitation district main existing within 400 feet of the property. They permit the connection and it doesn't require that property to be annexed into that taxing entity. Next slide. So we have a couple of different system types that do tend to go in for OWTS uh, systems. We, what we term a conventional OWTS system is one that does not require design by a professional engineer. So it has to have a specific soil type to meet those and it's typically a sandy soil that accepts effluent um, readily. 
number there can only be one living structure connected to the system so you can't have multiple dwell multiple living livable structures connected to one system you can however have auxiliary buildings so you can have a workshop or a barn or a bathroom in a garage that is connected to the same system as your primary residence or a primary livable structure and that can still be conventional if the soil type will allow um, as long as that secondary structure or auxiliary building does not contain livable space. System use, so typically these are going to be for single family residential units. Um, they are, they cannot be commercial use, so anything that is commercial requires engineering. Um, so really we're only going to see those in single family residential units with good soil types. And they're most of the time, I mean, they are always gravity fed or dosed. They can have a pump to meet fall um, to meet that gravity component, but essentially what that does is it pumps it into another distribution component and it gravity flows to the field. So they're, typ they're typically always gravity fed. Uh, these systems can be installed by the homeowner. It does require the permit T and to be the permit holder, uh, or I'm sorry, the permit T or permit holder to be that homeowner as well. So if I want to go install a system for my friend, I can't do that um, unless I'm licensed in El Paso County to do so. And we license at tier one or two tier two levels currently. Next slide. The engineered OWTS, uh, obviously they, they require design and oversight by a Colorado registered professional engineer. Typically, the soil types you're going to see these go into are clay or high rock content soils. Um, they may have a limiting layer such as bedrock or groundwater. Um, again, we are trying to protect that groundwater system by treating the effluent before it gets there. So there are restrictions and limitations or regulations that have to be met prior to that getting to the groundwater table. Um, the number of structures connected, it can be either a single structure it can be a multiple family dwelling, meaning an apartment complex or two single family residential homes connected into one system. Um, commercial as well. So again, system use single family, multifamily and commercial. Um, these have a variety of distribution methods and system types, so they can be um, laid out in a variety of ways. Some of them can be mounted above grade. Um, they can go into what we call a seepage pit, which is essentially a very deep excavation um, with concrete rings in, in the ground that allow the effluent to seep out around them. Um, they utilize pressure distribution, but they can also be gravity flow as well. Um, the pressure distribution is considered higher level treatment in El Paso County, in addition to in-tank treatment units as well. These systems are required to be installed by a tier two licensed installer and cannot be installed by a homeowner. Next slide. So a couple items just to be aware of that are not necessarily easily read in the regulations. Um, OWTS permits are required prior to obtaining a building permit. So that means our, you know, the processing time can potentially delay a building permit if it's not submitted early enough in the process. Um, statute and OWTS regulations require all buildings where people work, live, or congregate to have a form of sewage disposal, uh, which does mean that it all has to go into an on-site wastewater treatment system. Um, El Paso County currently does not recognize or has not adopted the gray water regulations at this point for reuse yet. Um, so planning can save time while trying to obtain an OWTS and building permit. However, we are working through some pre-construction review, potentially um, a process to hopefully help facilitate expediting obtaining that building permit as we move forward in our streamlining of the process. Additional considerations for OWTS parameters, um, design parameters. Again, all that generated wastewater, whether it's gray water, black water, any other type of water, all has to go into an OWTS on the property. Um, installation of incinerating or composting toilets, which is becoming um, quite popular, that while that can be done, we do have regulations around that. Uh, they do not impact the OWTS system sizing. So installation of those toilets will not reduce your OWTS requirement or sizing requirement. 
holding tanks are not permitted for installation unless there are specific circumstances around that. And typically any new construction, it's not going to be permitted for holding tank. However, some existing properties that are smaller than that two and a half acres, you know, a holding tank may be the only viable option. However, they do get expensive to maintain long term, so we try to avoid those at all at all extremes and, and possibilities. Multifamily dwelling systems must be designed at full occupancy of both single family residential structures. So what that means is if I have a three bedroom manufactured home on my lot and I'm applying to put a, another three bedroom manufactured home on there and tie it into the same system, I have to design those both at full capacity. I can't just add those additional bedrooms at as, as the additional bedroom allowance in the regs. So four, it's 450 gallons for a three bedroom structure. So I have to be able to, I have to design that system at 900 gallons to meet the minimum regulation requirement. Um, uh, construction errors will negate any opportunity at applying for a variance. So if the well was to go in on a small lot before your on-site system does, and now you can't meet setbacks, we don't have an ability to grant a variance in that um, instance because of a construction error. So planning and making sure that your site will fit that on-site system is very very important otherwise you may find yourself in a spot where you could have to uninstall everything and then try to put it back on after the fact next slide so this slide has a little bit about our permit types that we currently are issuing as well as processing times and what they typically um, encompass. So our new permit is for new construction. It is a system that has never existed um, either tied to a structure or on that property um, at any point previous to that first application. Uh, it is a $920 fee and that does include a surcharge for the planning department to review the site plan as well. And then every by statute, every permit that we have has to charge the $23 surcharge um, that does go to the state and into a fund that is mandated in statute. Um, each of our applications do include an application review, a soil, a soil and design review, as well as a final inspection. Um, our processing times are three to five weeks on a new permit. The modification permit is new as of 2018, and that permit is designed to, um, it, it really encompasses things such as like a system location change or a change of use and or an increase in bedrooms. So if I have a four bedroom and I wanna put in two bedrooms in my basement and make it a six bedroom house, I have to modify my system to be able to accommodate that. And that's a modification. Um, the other thing we see a lot is I am a new homeowner or I just moved in and I don't like where the system is and I want to move it. That's a modification also. Major repairs are any repair to a soil treatment area due to a system failure, which is typically described as um, effluent surfacing or backing up into the home. And a minor repair permit deals with the um, tank component or piping of or any part of that piping system uh, with throughout the on-site wastewater treatment system. We do require minor repair permits if you change your distribution. So if it has a, a documented manifold distribution and you put a distribution box in, we would require a permit for that. Um, if you get to a point in your construction and something has to change because you can't meet layout or setbacks or just the contour of the land and you have to change something within that design, we do require an alteration to the permit and we can renew those permits as many times as necessary in order for you to complete that installation. Um, because all of our permits have one final inspection tied to them, any additional inspections, whether they are requested partials or the system didn't meet standards, would be charged an, an additional fee. Next slide.
Thank you. So when I apply for an on-site wastewater treatment system, what is required in that application? Um, so you have uh, four things that are typically required. So we do have an electronic permit application and we do encourage all of those to be submitted electronically to us to in, and this will facilitate processing. Any while we will still accept paper applications, if you submit a paper application, there is a potential for a delay in processing that. Um, we will have uh, likely to have a new permanent application separate from the modification and repair. As of right now on our website, it is all one application. Um, we do require the entire thing to be filled out, including a written scope of work, so that we can ensure the understanding of what is happening. Um, number two is a soils analysis report. It is important to note that all of our soils is required to be stamped by a professional engineer. Um, it can be completed by a competent technician or a soil scientist, but they do have to be stamped by that professional engineer um, before being submitted. They do have to include two soil profile pit evaluations, and that is typically a two foot to three foot wide hole dug about eight feet deep um, or deeper. It just depends on how deep you're installing the system. Eight feet is typically the max because you cannot install deeper than 48 inches. So we need to understand that other 48 inches below where you're going to install. Um, if another important item is Percolation test is what they used to be called, which was a hole that they drilled in the ground and then filled with water and uh, verified the amount, the ability of the soil to accept the water. Uh, those are no longer accepted as the sole soils analysis. So if they can still be submitted, but your soils analysis still has to include those two profile pits. Um, the design calculations with engineered systems, it's typically all part of the engineer um, completed information that's submitted to us. The difference is conventional systems. We do have design worksheets on our website that must be filled out and submitted. They are, one is called a short form and one is a comprehensive form. The short form is, there. there's not a whole lot of difference between the two. The short form is more intended for installers or GCs who understand the process, know what they're, you know, have a good solid background and, and have been doing it a long time. Where the comprehensive form is designed more for that homeowner who's doing this as a one-off system and it really helps walk you through what the requirements of the submission. Um, addition number four, the design document, it does have to be easily readable. Typically that's an eight and a half by 11. Um, must include both the proposed and alternate OWTS locations. And this is important to ensure that should the initial system fail for whatever reason, there is still space or an alternative location to install another system on that property. Um, and this design document must provide a detailed system layout. So it has to have those profile pit locations marked, including distances to any important setbacks as required in the regs. And must, and must provide the infiltrative surface depth and in specifics on any limiting layers or imported sand material. So in every permit, except for the minor repair, all four of these are expected to be submitted at one time. If any one of these is missing, the application is put on hold or sent back to the applicant until a complete submission is received. We cannot process incomplete submissions. Next slide. Okay. Thank you. All so all OWTS permits, again, like I said, must have a complete submission that includes all of those items that we previously discussed. Um, and it's important here to note too that just because I turn an application in and make my payment for the permit fee, that does not imply that you have a permit at that moment. You physically have to have a copy of that permit on hand before or in your hands before construction can start. Um, again, just some information down there, our email address, HEA septic info at elpasoco.com. That is where all of your electronic submissions should go. That goes directly to our, our OWTS team. Um, again, paper submissions will likely delay processing times even further. Um, next slide. 
so what happens after I submit a complete application? Um, submission, when it is determined to be complete, the applicant will be sent an invoice via email for payment um, within one to two days of that submission. Typically, um, it'll be sent to the emails listed on the application, and then that application is on hold until the fee has been paid. If that submission is incomplete, we do try a phone call or email first to obtain all the, the necessary documents or corrections um, to be submitted. If we don't have any luck with that, then we will send it back in the mail to the applicant. Um, additionally, you know, once we receive all the correct information, that is then when we go back to the one to two days for an invoice to be sent, and then we're pending payment on that. Um, applicant, once we do have the payment, the application is assigned for review. Uh, new OWTS permit applications are also at this point sent to the Development Services Division uh, for their site plan review. And again, that construction of that OW, OWTS cannot begin until that permit has been issued. Next slide. Our specialist review process includes an application review, which is a comprehensive and detailed review of all of the submitted material for compliance with the regulations. We review the soils analysis report to make sure that it is labeled and marked consistently with the USDA soil characteristics. Um, it is also evaluated for any limiting layers, um, differing soil horizons and where those exist relative to where they're telling us that that system is going to be installed. Um, we're looking particularly of concern for groundwater or redoxomorphic features, bedrock and high rock content. Um, and we do have quite a few areas in El Paso County that have high rock content. Um, determining the most restrictive layer in that soil type. So the most restrictive layer can be a soil type. It can be a limiting layer such as groundwater or bedrock. And then that will give us the information to determine how much separation distance is needed to each of those la layers or what the sizing of that system will be required to be based on soil type, as well as number of bedrooms. Um, the design and calculation review. So the design is reviewed to ensure that it meets all applicable regulations, the same with the soils. Um, we're gonna look at the layout, making the location of that. We're gonna make sure it meets all setbacks to both on-site physical features and limiting soil layers, in addition to any potential setbacks to that are off property. So we will evaluate the the individual property and the setbacks, let's say from a soil treatment area to a well on that property in addition to the neighboring properties. So not only do you have to be 100 feet from your personal well, but you also have to be 100 feet from your in your neighbor's wells as well. Uh, appropriate sizing based on number and type of structures as well as bedrooms. Uh, next slide. Uh, after that is done and we, we have a good understanding of what the plan installation is at that time, we will then physically visit the, the property to determine the, the location of those profile pits to make sure that they are where they're telling us they are, um, that there's nothing of concern pre-construction um, physically on that site that's going to give us any concern um, for installation in that area. Um, and essentially it's it's an evaluation of that site for suitability to install a septic system. Um, permit issuance is then completed after this step. If everything meets applicable regulations, there's no concerns for the setback or being able to install on that particular property. We will go ahead and approve the application, approve the site evaluation and issue the permit. Um, next. So after that, next steps the permit gives you that permission to begin construction so essentially you cannot begin digging even trenching out or digging the tank hole until you have that permit um, it does require the work to be completed by an el paso county licensed installer which we do have a list of on our website um, construction of the owts once that has been completed the permit has um, the phone number for the final request line on there we do expect the final re final inspections to be called in by 3 p.m. the day prior to your requested inspection. So anything called in by 3 p.m. today would be assigned for inspection tomorrow. Um, 
we do expect the full system to be installed and to be inspected because we do only have one inspection built into the cost of that permit. If for some reason the installer needs to backfill the line between the house and the tank or the tank itself so the other contractors can get in and do some work, we will accommodate partial inspections. They just incur additional fees. Um, if for some reason we don't approve the install and we have to go back to do a follow up, that is also an additional fee as well. Once our inspections are assigned to the specialist, they will provide a window. Um, right now we are doing these manually, so they, I create a PDF document every day and it gets attached to our website, um, which you can find that on our on-site wastewater treatment system at ElPasoCountyHealth.org. Um, final system approval is all components must be installed and, and their functionality verified prior to approval or sign off for a new system. Um, essentially meaning that the pump must be functional, so we have to verify that the pump does have electrical to it. The alarm will go off and, and the test function is um, working. And then we also must verify the well has been installed and meets required setbacks. If at the time of final inspection the well is not installed, we will have to do a follow up for that to verify and that is an additional fee as well. Next slide. Final system approval. So for conventional systems, our El Paso County public health inspectors give that final approval for those and it and then they once they have a final approval for that system, it is allowed to be backfilled and our El Paso County inspector will log into regional building and give the approval through there. Um, for engineered systems, our inspectors are inspecting for compliance with the design as submitted and the regulations, but the ultimate final approval for engineered systems does come from the engineer who is providing that oversight. This does require submission of an engineer certification letter and record drawing prior to El Paso County being able to complete the approval in the regional building system. Uh -huh. And those, those certification letter and record drawing are typically submitted to HEA septic info at elpasoco.com. The engineers do not send those directly to us. So typically they are sent to whoever is contracted with that engineer and whoever is that person that they get sent to needs to submit them to us directly. And it does take about one to two days uh, to final those out from receiving that documentation. Uh, next. Um, so if your plans change during construction, we or the installer runs into a soil type that is not consistent with the report submitted, we do require the construction to stop and have a discussion with us to obtain approval prior to continuing. So if we're, you know, if we run into an area where we plan to install trenches, but we have to install a bed due to some something in the field, um, that requires a new permit to be issued. If we find a different soil type, we have to stop and evaluate the design um, for compliance with that soil type as well. Uh, they must complete a change request form in order to do this. Uh, minor changes that do not impact system sizing. So if we have if we can't make fall because of the stub out on the, the new construction or the stub out for the plumbing on the home, sometimes you have to install a pump tank and a, and a pump. Uh, that typically can be done as long as there's no system sizing reductions being taken. Um, for repairs, you know, if you're changing from a narrow bed to a wide bed because there's utility lines you have to miss, um, that typically can be done because it doesn't impact system sizing. Major repairs, that these are things that do impact system sizing, so that change from trenches to a bed or vice versa, um, change in adding structures, adding number of bedrooms, those types of things constitute system sizing impacts and they have to be communicated to us in a new permit issued. Um, next slide. And that is all for me. All right, my name is Pietro Rangel and I um, work in planning and community development as an admin tech three. Um, I process front counter and residential applications. Um, 
And our process for the OWTS applications is to verify address, parcel number, legal description, acreage, and then the creation date if um, a parcel is unplatted and under 35 acres. Um, we review the site plan for the location of primary and alternative systems. We verify notes from the plat regarding septic um, location, and then we check the plat for easements and no builds for possible encroachments. Um, and we also verify notes on the PUD um, if any are ap uh, applicable. Um, there's a sample site plan here. And then next slide, please. We take our data from the application itself and then we process a form and send it back for um, or with our approval or denial um, to the health department. And I'll pass it along to David. And before David gets started, I just want to remind everyone that we are going to be taking all questions at the end. So feel free to submit any questions you may have now or throughout the rest of the presentation, just in the Q&A uh, tool within the meeting. And now David Kirst from CDPH. David, go ahead. So uh, before I start talking about the state process a little bit, I will make some references to what Kat already talked about. I just thought it was helpful sometimes to if we look back at the framework and why certain things have happened the way they are. So uh, a couple of introductory slides just because when you when you know the beginning of the story, sometimes the rest of it makes a little more sense. Um, back in the late 1960s, the, there were difficulties. Um, they had started to identify some stream standards, but there was absolutely no way to identify who was um, who was maybe responsible for for stream standards? And so you know, it's kind of like if you live in a, a house with a bunch of college students or somebody, you don't know who's going to clean up and who's responsible and who's who's got the dirty dishes in the in the sink. And there was just no way to link any one discharger to violations of stream standards. There was a slow pace, therefore, and also um, for other pollution efforts, technologies were coming on the scene in the '60s. Remember the space race and everything else. So. Um, there was there was hope, but there wasn't much progress. Um, the fishing industry was noticing fishing was going down. There was contamination and fish kills. Uh, bacterial levels in rivers they weren't very swimmable. Uh, and in 1969, the the one that really gave you know when every time you have an image or a picture, you get uh, you get a lot more attention. Um, in Cleveland, Ohio, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire and it actually caught on fire a few other times but this time they had film they had pictures and it was an oil slick caught on fire it caused significant damage to some uh, railroad bridges and uh and so that kind of captured people's attention but also drinking water sources were starting to have some contamination and, and so that the, the biggest way to get somebody somebody's attention is is to affect their drinking water next slide um so in the 70s we had the, the clean water act and the um colorado has a water quality control act the way it works a lot of times the if the state is going to implement a program like the feds had the uh the um they have to have they have to be very very similar things so the uh the 1970s, the Clean Water Act, it had a couple of different names, but initially, but that's that's basically what it goes by now. The objective became, hey, let's restore and then maintain the the integrity of the nation's waters, so surface waters. And, and the goal at the time, the, the 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 short name for it was, let's create fishable and swimmable water quality, and uh, so. From that, then, then there became a framework. Okay, now how are we going to identify if we don't have good water quality? Who might be responsible? So every source was going to get a permit. So the idea is if there was a source, meaning a discharge, and there would be pollutants, that was going to get a permit. And and that way they could monitor and, and, and control what, what's going out into the waters. 
the way that showed up in, in, in the legislation and everything is, is it was the, this is actually a sentence I just put in bullet points, but that all point sources discharging a pollutant into the water of the state must obtain a permit. Um, and, and the waters of the state include surface water and groundwater. If anybody's really in the know, they probably know that through the change of administrations and all, there's been this discussion about, quote, waters of the U.S. and where that definition lies. But in Colorado, waters of the state are um, surface water and groundwater. Next slide. Uh, so for wastewater treatment, the, the threshold in the Colorado Water Quality Control Act is there, there's two programs and they're based on system size. So the first one is considered the On-Site Wastewater Treatment System Act. It's, it's a slightly separate from the Colorado Water Quality Control Act. Um, that's the OWTS. That's the program that Kat mentioned earlier. So 2,000 gallons per day or less, those uh, are um, systems are, are put in through local agency programs. There's 60 some counties in Colorado, 50 some uh, local public health because some come cover a couple counties. Uh, and, uh, and, and they have those programs and do the permitting. There is a state regulation, it's regulation 43. No one really implements 43 per se. They implement their own reg that is similar to reg 43. Um, but what we're here to talk about in my section is what is for the larger systems under the Colorado Water Quality Control Act. So those are what we call domestic wastewater treatment works. And that's true of the big city um, facilities like Carl Springs has, um, or it's, but it's also true of something, let's say at a camp where they have enough flow that it's gonna be over 2000 gallons per day. That's still considered a domestic wastewater treatment works. Um, so it includes the treatment facilities. It includes lift stations with a capacity greater than 2000 gallons per day. Also it includes um, interceptors with a 24 inch or greater diameter. So the, the eight or 10 or 12 inch mains in a street aren't considered uh, domestic wastewater treatment works, but, but the larger interceptors are. And if you say, well, wait, those aren't treatment. The, the law actually calls them like appurtenances. So the lift stations and the interceptors over 24 inches. So anyway, uh, they all go through our approval though, those things, treatment facilities, lift stations and interceptors, 24 inches or greater. So the, the regulations adopted by the Water Quality Control Commission, um, Reg 22, is the one that we'll talk about a little more today. Site location approval and design approval or design review. The uh, Reg 61 is, is the one that actually goes through the permitting for the discharge itself. Next slide. Um, real quick overview, just how it jives with our program for the on-site wastewater treatment systems. Again, that would be at the local county in, in El Paso County, so El, Paso, El Paso County Public Health. That's typically your residential, single family, um, maybe a small multifamily like a duplex or something, but but go with Kat's presentation on that. Um, small commercial, let's say an office that's still it's domestic wastewater uh, from the restrooms or break room or whatever that could be, or a small camp possibly. Um, but uh, it's really only domestic wastewater. Any non-domestic wastewater or industrial, um, is managed through other methods so they'd have to figure out what makes sense that's probably through consultation with cat and talking to us and we can we can point somebody in the right direction next slide um i mentioned that the 2000 gallons a day is the nice cutoff point smaller than greater than like everything bureaucratic maybe we've got to have this one little in between and really what this is is it, it's a way of being flexible uh, Obviously, if somebody has five acre lots and they've got a couple of OWTS on there, eat, oh, excuse me, a couple, one on each lot, and then let's say it was a total of three lots, that's 15 acres. If somebody came along and has a 15 acre site and they are looking at doing, like Kat mentioned, two, maybe two residences on it, but for the same owner, um, and if those were to be over, 2,000 gallons a day, but there's really enough room for them uh, to be separate. 
this might be true of a camp if it's got like a boys dorm and a girls dorm or something like that. Um, the state came up with a policy some years ago. We recently updated it mainly for for style and branding, but uh, and to use the term on-site wastewater treatment systems. Uh, but we do allow, and we work with the counties like CAT to, to figure out a, the best way um, to implement this policy, but it, it acknowledges that there might be enough land by a single owner to have more than one OWTS um, and and still not, uh, it, even if they add together and are more than 2,000 gallons a day, they might be able to be separate and, and be permitted through the locals. Um, so next slide, we're going to show a picture. Basically, the policy says, let's take the soil treatment area, which would be designed according to the to, to the OWTS regulations, add a horizontal influence area. The distance for that horizontal influence area is based on the flow of the, the design capacity of the system. And that's why they're different in this, because let's say tank, their system one and system two have two different flows. Uh, these This distance would be identified in the state, uh, in our policy, policy six. And what this does is says, okay, you could have two and they might add together be over 2000, which would put them into our uh, area for, for permitting. But because they can be easily separated enough based on the calculations in this policy, we're going to let them be permitted at the county level under the OWTS program. So things we're looking for in this kind of evaluation of, with policy six and what it describes over in several pages anyway, is that these two horizontal influence areas, the gray areas on that figure, they don't overlap and they don't overlap on a well or a, a waterway like that. So um, so that that's a little bit of a, a way that on some sites they might be able, if it's again a, like a camp or somebody that's got more property, they might be able to do a couple of systems um, permanent at the county level. Um, next slide. For design flow rates, we look at uh, the service popula service area. What's the population? What's the uses? Much like if somebody is putting in a big um, development, they're going to have so many single family units and, and all and on a large scale. A small scale, we generally use the same planning values uh, in the, the regulation 43, which would be the same values that are in the El Paso County um, regulation. And so some examples are 150 gallons per day per bedroom for residential, 300 gallons per day per space for mobile home park, uh, 100 gallons per day per unit for like a travel trailer park where there's individual water and sewage hook up to each unit. Um, that, that's if there's no other data for somebody. So let's, let's say somebody's coming with a smaller system, not a big municipal system, but it's uh, um, you know, a mobile home park with 30, we're gonna have 30 spaces or something. We're trying to figure out what would be an appropriate flow to design the system. It's over 2000 gallons a day, it's gonna be at the state level, but there is no existing data. Uh, sometimes it's a facility that does have some data and so we do allow and look at sometimes three years of representative matched daily data. Um, we say matched because we we need to understand if it's uh, the population and the flow data to know if it's um, uh, how, what do I say? I guess we're looking for, you know, if, if three of the units have been vacant for several days or several months, if it's a, uh, um, a seasonal tourist type location we need to know is it is this July or August when the everything is packed and full or or the rest of the year so we can kind of get a daily um, flow per person but then then look at what it would be at maximum occupancy when the the, the location is full um, if there were uh, let's say cabins and it's so many gallons a day per cabin, or per person in the cabins or whatever. Uh, that way we could figure that out a little bit, even if only two or three cabins had somebody in them and then multiply by 
the total number of cabins to figure out what the design capacity of the system should be. Um, anyway, and then the last bullet is any other applicable or widely accepted planning or engineering reference manuals. Uh, obviously, any design engineer is going to be able to get their hands on some literature and find some applicable uh, values for that. So uh, we'll uh, we, we, we'll kind of take different methods, but if today's focus is a little bit on those, let's say they're maybe between like two and eight or ten thousand gallons a day, some kind of a development that's looking at doing its own wastewater treatment facility, we're probably going to be using a lot of those same um, planning values out of the table. Uh, next slide. So the the state systems, if you want to call it that, or the domestic wastewater treatment works, um, they have uh, it's, a, it's a multiple step process for us. The, if you think about what we said earlier, there's going to be some design review steps in the middle, but at the end, there's going to be a permit to discharge to a water of the state. And we need to understand what's the flow going to be and what are those limits going to be because they allow some some mixing in the stream to, to maintain still the, the stream water quality. So, or, or groundwater, if it's a groundwater discharge. The, uh, so the first step in this, basically a four step process, water quality planning targets from permits section. So that's that could be um, effluent limits, if it's gonna go to a discharge into the ground or to the surface water, if it's gonna go into some kind of a recycling program, say say uh, reclaimed water irrigation of, a, of um, a golf course or park or something like that, it's gonna, it's gonna have some quote effluent limit target and we need to know that going in and then the site location application um, can be for for a new facility it could be for a facility that's changing specifically or or one that might be derating meaning trying to downsize and so there's an initial engineering report it's really more of a local review because the county gets involved the health department gets involved the, the local health excuse me um, as well as a 208 agency 208 is the section of the Clean Water Act that allows or, or has identified agencies that are work on water quality planning for their agent area, excuse me. And uh, the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments is the 208 agency there in El Paso County. Um, so they would look at it, those entities would look at it and agree, sign off on an application, and then it would come to us and we would do review through our engineering section. Again, that's more of a planning level. It says, here's our, our, our uh, uh, service area, here's the flows, and here's kind of where we plan to put the facility and here's how we think we'll do the treatment. So planning level. The next step is the design review where it's actually a process design report. It says, now here are the unit processes, treatment processes we're gonna use. Then that goes through um, our engineering review and the final design certification, so the one that also includes how big are the concrete, how thick are the concrete walls, and, you know, some of the electrical drawings, things like that. Um, those are all certified by the design engineer. That that's pretty typical, um, not through us, but uh, but we would do the process design report and then say, yes, the basins are big enough. The the oxygen is going to be enough for the bugs to to do their work and treat the wastewater things like that and, and the uh, and then the last step is getting the discharge permit from our permit section so at that point the design has been approved and the permit and then the, the facility is ready to operate the one thing i note is just for a lift station which is basically a, a raw switch pump station those are uh they don't have a permit themselves so they just go through the site location and the design review step the, the middle two out of those four um Next slide. So one of the big questions always is, what's the time expectation? People are you kind of used to, I'm gonna remodel my home, I'm gonna go down to the building department and, and I'm gonna get kind of what I call an over-the-counter permit. I turn it in and then within a few minutes I've got it. Uh, as Kat mentioned, it, it takes a little longer on the OWTS side, it takes even longer on the state side. So it is not just an over-the-counter quick, quick give me approval. Um, the planning process, that site location process, has multiple steps. An engineer has to develop their, their engineering report, 
they have submitted at, like I said, several levels at the local um, health, local county, the 208 agency. They may have a review process and time for that. Then it comes to us. We do have a, a, a backlog, which means the day it's received, there's probably a few weeks before it's actually on um, somebody's to-do list it gets assigned to one of our review engineers and then they're going to have uh they're they'll be finishing some of the other work they're on and then they will pick it up so so there's a little bit of a backlog or a delay then there's review time uh, so the whole process with the, the site location and then the design review can often be six to 18 months so somebody turning in in may thinking they're going to build in june uh, on a state system is, is, is not really realistic. Um, the best way to shorten the time in our reviews is, is really to try and make sure something is complete up uh, when it, whenever it is submitted and not uh, accidentally or intentionally leaving things out. Uh, so, and then if there are questions from our review engineer, uh, either by email or by letter, that, that the response comes quick. I always tell people, yes, it may have taken the review engineer a month to get it and to get out some questions, but if, if the response is quick, they will look at it quickly because it's fresh on their mind. If they have moved on to some other reviews and then they get a response, they will pick up the response at some point when they probably finish the review they're on at that time. And, um, and so the, the more back and forth with questions, it can just extend the time. So the best, best methods to shorten time might be, uh, especially on a smaller site project would be to, to have a planning meeting with one of our unit managers from the engineering section to say, here's what we're thinking, da da da, and, and understand the steps a bit more. We can understand the project a bit more, but also to be, to have a thorough design up front, have the submittals uh, pretty complete, and and be responsive to to the questions. So, um, and then I mentioned that the design engineer will certify both the final design and after it's constructed, they would also submit a certification that says it was constructed as approved, meaning things didn't change um, after the approval or what was built in the field. So, as built is often how it's called. Um, anyway, that, that's ours. Thank you, David. Kerry is up next to talk about county planning, wastewater, and overview from the planning department. Kerry? Mute here. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, my name is Kerry Parsons, and I'm a planner with El Paso County Planning and Community Development. Um, and so why wastewater? Um, uh, El Paso County is a statutory county, which means that our land development code was written based on our the statutes, the state statutes. And so the purpose of our land development code, specifically chapter eight, uh, section 8.4.8, .8, is to establish that wastewater disposable visions at the subdivision or starting with like a sketch plan, which is a very basic plan that a developer would submit to county staff. It kind of looks like a bubble plan. And then the next step would be like a preliminary plan where you're actually seeing lot light lots or tracks for open space, schools, parks, you're seeing roadways, um, you're seeing sidewalks in the preliminary plan. And then the final plan, is also a component of that subdivision development stage. Um, and so when um, we evaluate wastewater uh, with the subdivision stage, we are doing that to ensure conformance with the wastewater disposal section of our land development code and the other agencies such as El Paso County Public Health and Environment and Colorado Department of Public and, uh, Health. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so the Land Development Code defines um, uh, OWTS um, as an absorption system of any size or flow or system or facility for treating, neutralizing, stabilizing, or dispersing sewage 
generated in the vicinity which system is not part of or connected to a sewage treatment works. Um, so by sewage treatment works, I mean like a municipality such as Colorado Springs Utilities um, or say Whitefield Water and Sanitation District where it's, where it's going into a public utility system. So this term may be used interchangeably with the term OWTS or systems where the context is used within the code or the other agencies, as I mentioned, EPC Health or the state. Next slide, please. And then uh, the other form of wastewater system, which is very typical when we are dealing with land development, going back to those stages of subdivision that I mentioned, sketch plan, preliminary plan, and final plan, is what we call a centralized wastewater system, um, similar to like what CSU or Widefield Water and Sanitation would be. The Land Development Code defines that as a system for the provision to the public of water for human consumption through pipes or other constructed conveyances, and re, re, excuse me, and which provides at least 15 service connections used by year-round residents of the area served by the system, or that regularly serves at least 25 year-round residents. So what does that mean in a nutshell? So in a nutshell, in order for a, a central wastewater system to be established, a developer has to have at least 15 homes connected and operational. So those people are living in those homes and they're flushing their toilets, using their showers um, year round, and then they would be able to move through and finish up the state's process um, uh, in conjunction with El Paso County's process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's important to just make a uh, mention of this. So in terms of development in, in relation to subdivision, um, a central wastewater system is required a method for wastewater collection and treatment in all of our new subdivisions in El Paso County um, that have a density greater than one dwelling unit per two and a half acres. In a nutshell, any lots that are smaller than 2.5 acres are going to be required to either tie into an existing central wastewater system, i.e. CSU, Widefield, et cetera, or um, they may be in the situation where they are going to create a new centralized water system, and then they will begin working with the county, that 208 agency that the uh, CDPH and &E referred to, and of course CDPH and &E for a very technical review. I should mention that if a developer, it's okay, Lauren, you can move forward. If a developer does uh, elect to tie into a central water system, wastewater system that does exist, your county staff will be requiring evidence of that, and we will require a commitment letter from that wastewater provider um, verifying that that development can be served by that utility, i.e., they, they have the ability to expand, to grow to service that. Um, see here. So steps to establish that new central wastewater system if a utility company is not able to provide services to a new development. Um, it's a very long extended process. So I'm just gonna highlight um, a couple things. So the first step is going to be to have a some type of sketch plan, that first part of your subdivision uh, process approved. And then after a developer kind of knows what he's going to do, how many lots, how many parks, how many schools, he's going to likely initiate what we call a service plan or otherwise known as a special district, um, also referred to a metropolitan district. And that'll be in, in accordance with our state statutes uh, 32.1.201. And that service plan would be submitted to El Paso County Planning and Community Development, reviewed by staff and several other agencies. And then ultimately it will go before our Planning Commission and our Board of County Commissioner for approval. And then it will go to election and uh, then it would be created. The next process um, after that special district uh, to create a new central wastewater system to serve a development is going to be for the district that was recently created to um, submit a 
1041 permit in accordance with our land development code appendix B, um, and that's um, areas of state interest. And then um, after that long approval is done, um, the applicant is going to provide design plans to um, El Paso County Public Health and to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment for their review process. And as our partner um, just mentioned, cdph and &E's process isn't something that you're gonna turn those design plans in and expect a turnaround really quick. It really does take that, the, that longer time period. Um, and I believe he was referencing the on-site water treatment systems. Um, so you can imagine that these new centralized wastewater systems may even take longer. Um, and so once those approvals have been received by um, our EPC and cdph &E, um, the, that newly created special district will start operating in compliance and uh, they would start building those, those homes. And basically, once those homes are established, we go full circle back to our definition and we say, okay, now we've got 15 homes operating and now we're really um, able to finalize that new wastewater system as a new public central wastewater treatment system. So that's very um, broad view, uh, overview of um, establishing a new wastewater system. Um, next slide, please, Lauren. Um, and let's see here. I want to go back and just kind of piggyback on something that Kat had mentioned. So jumping back to what we have is the OWTS. If a developer did choose to um, utilize the on-site wastewater treatment system for his new development versus uh, an existing centralized wastewater treatment system or creating a new one, there are um, specific reports that county staff is going to review and send out to review agencies. Um, and basically what we're going to look for is very similar to what um, CAT is looking for with El Paso County Public Health and Environment. Is we're, in a nutshell, we're just gonna make sure that we're the, the systems that are designed for that subdivision are not gonna contaminate or interfere with surface waters, groundwater, um, the neighboring's uh, neighbor's ability to enjoy and use their land. We're going to make sure that there's no geologic or hydrologic um, concerns. Um, we're going to also, as Pietra mentioned, we're going to double check and make sure that there's no physical um, encroachments to setbacks or property lines. And as um, Pat also mentioned, we're going to verify that those reports that they submit do safely depict two areas that each lot has. Um, that are capable of holding their own uh, wastewater treatment system so that if one fails they can jump on to that other lot or maybe the homeowner changes their mind and they don't want to build a home there in that lot and so they have that secondary site that they can switch to. Um, next slide. And so as a, I kind of alluded to, um, after uh, the county staff at planning receives those, we do send those reports out to other agencies and ultimately before county planning staff takes an item to planning commission and board of county commissioner for that subdivision approval, we're going to receive a letter from our partners, uh, El Paso County Public Health and Environment, stating that there is an adequacy finding that whether it's a centralized uh, treatment system or uh, tie, tying into a new treatment system, excuse me, tying into an existing system like CSU or Whitefield Water and Sanitation System, or they're going to be creating a new wastewater treatment system through the state's process, or they're simply going to do their on-site wastewater treatment system. We're gonna make sure that El Paso County Public Health makes that adequacy finding, and we will present that to our Board of County Commissioners for their final recommendation. And then next slide, please. And then, uh, typical, typical conditions of approval that your county planning staff would impose on a, a developer for final plat as it re relates to wastewater, whether it's on-site wastewater treatment systems or a new system or tying into an existing system. We're going to do a contract known as the subdivision improvement agreement with the developer. And basically, we're going to ensure that that developer has the monies um, to install those improvements so that a person at the end uh, of it all, buying a lot, building a home, has a guarantee that 
they literally can move in, run their shower, run their dishwasher, and that water is going to be treated safely and removed from their lot and, and moved down the road. Um, and so next slide, please. Um, a couple other um, final plat conditions of approval that we will impose on a developer um, is that we're going to require that the developer meet not only our um, regulations, but Colorado Parks and Wildlife, for instance, um, Colorado Department of Transportation, United States Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, as it relates to endangered species. Um, those are all going to be very standard so that we can ensure the public that we are not impacting or the developer is not impacting um, lands that have um, regulation imposed by other jurisdictions outside of the county. And then lastly, um, if there was a new water, a wastewater treatment system being proposed, you're going to see a standard uh, condition of approval on a final plat. Um, that is going to tie into the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment's processes. And it's going to be very technical. It's that final step after you've got 15 new homes flushing toilets. And it's basically like the final reporting through Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment before they're closed out with their new wastewater treatment system. Um, and so that is what that last condition um, is referencing, and we call it a, a TMF, uh, Technical Managerial Financial Capacity Assessment Report. Um, and then you'll have specific engineers certifying that the infrastructure for the wastewater treatment systems have been installed and are functioning properly, which is why we need at least 15 homes to be utilizing those. Um, and so, Lauren, that kind of that was the speedy version and sums up um, how that all ties back into the land development code and our subdivision regs related to wastewater. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So um, as the slides say, that's our presentation, our formal presentation part. Um, and thank you, everybody. That was very thorough. I definitely learned a lot about septic and central wastewater systems. So we're going to get to questions now, which some of you have submitted through the chat. Um, so I'm just going to go through these and of our presenters, whoever feels the most equipped to answer the question at hand, uh, feel free to jump in. So let's see. Um, we'll start with how will the proposed pre-construction review process differ from the current review process? That sounds like a good one for Kat maybe to answer. Yes, so I will take that. Um, but we're working through what that process will look like now. Um, the hope is that we can hopefully get something out within a maybe five to seven day timeline. Uh, given that the statutes require us to issue a permit, um, we have some details to work out with that. But we're hoping that compared to the three to five weeks it takes to do a full comprehensive review, that there's something that we could potentially do within a five to seven business day turnaround time to hopefully facilitate obtaining building permits a little quicker. Awesome. Thank you, Kat. Um, this is from Robert. This one's a little long. So he's wondering, he's thinking about scenarios where a subdivision is proposed near existing residential lots and the former proposes a new wastewater line while the latter have a long-standing septic system. So he's curious about the process to re replace that septic system when a wastewater line is installed. So I can probably take that one too. Um, my, my initial thoughts on that is when they bring that water line there, again, that goes back to the 400 feet rule um, for a property. So if a property is within 400 feet of a central main, no matter how it got there, it would have to connect. Um, again, those defining factors for that would be whether or not the property that is on septic is annexed into that taxing entity or the um, provide the wastewater provider does not permit them to connect. So that wastewater provider does have to provide a letter that permits them to connect and they have to be in that taxing entity to do so. Um, you know, so it, it's going to depend on how those lots are um, zoned essentially when it comes down to it. 
Awesome. And I think this kind of goes along with that, but what's the minimum design criteria for a new livable structure, Kat? Um, I might need clarification on that. So like I guess gallons per day, I suppose. Yeah, so a new single family residential construction, the minimum currently in the regulations is 300 gallons per day. So every even if that structure is a one bedroom structure and it's new construction, it has to be designed at a minimum of two bedroom capacity. Great. All right, our next question comes from Mitchell. Um, I, just a clarification, I think on um, something Carrie said. So in regards to the Board of County Commissioners approval, the BOCC is just approving the plat, not the on-site wa uh, wastewater treatment system, correct? <clears throat> or so guess what, what does the, BOCC approve? So the Board of County Commissioners is approving the subdivision. And when the Board of County Commissioners approves the subdivision, they are making a, a finding of adequacy uh, based on the board of or El Paso County Public Health. It's one of the criteria for a subdivision approval. And so they're taking the recommendations that come from El Paso County Public Health and Environment and utilizing El Paso County Public Health and Environment as the experts and making their, rec their finding based on CAT or El Paso County Public Health's recommendation. And I, it's it's the same side for a, a water finding as well as it ties to subdivision. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Um, this one's a little more specific. If I purchase a lot in a subdivision, does that mean the major issues for septic have been worked out already? Is it fair to assume that? Yes. So um, if, if you have purchased a lot in a subdivision, that means that your El Paso County staff, your and uh, including planning and um, public health, have reviewed those wastewater reports. Um, they have reviewed those designs, from either if it's on-site wastewater treatment or a connect connectivity via utility plan with the subdivision, and they are good to go. And so that prop that subdivision has moved through, the board has approved it, you're buying a lot that has safe services. And Carrie, can you explain how somebody would know if their property that they're potentially buying has gone through the subdivision process? Yes, so the, the easiest way to find out if you're buying a platted lot in a subdivision um, is to look at the assessor's webpage and type in the address of that property you're interested in and look at that legal description. And if it says lot one of Misty Acres subdivision, it's a legal lot. It'll also have the plat number on that and you can look up that plat and you can see if there was an area that was depicted as a no build area. And you also be able to tell if that plat say is um, on central wa wastewater or a on-site wastewater treatment system. There'll, there'll be notes on the plat as well. And Carrie, there are some that predate 1972 that probably should be evaluated differently, correctly? Correct. So if you have a plat and you, you, you pull that up and you realize that plat was recorded prior to 1972, what that means is that that plat didn't, is likely to have not gone through our vigorous regulations and review for wastewater. And so you want to double check with county planning staff and public health to make sure that the particular lot or tract that you're interested in purchasing and building on um, can and is suitable for your on-site wastewater treatment system or has the ability to tie into a utility provider to provide wastewater services. It's all really good information. Lauren, I, can I just jump in and add Please. a point of clarification on that? Um, I just want to make it, it clear that our review from that perspective really is saying that we agree that the on-site waste, that this property would utilize an on-site wastewater treatment system. Um, so there could still be some obstacles to installing that system as long as the engineering is appropriate when submitted as uh, to obtain the OWTS permit. You shouldn't have very many obstacles, but if the engineering is not done in a way that is compliant with the regulations, that could prolong the system installation. So just because the the plat has been subdivided or it's a legal lot doesn't necessarily mean that you won't have 
concerns or we won't have concerns on the OWTS design itself, but we have essentially just recognized that that lot will be an OWTS lot. Does that make sense? I think so. Carrie? Okay. Yes, I, I think so. And I think that that's a great full circle back to what Pietra with our planning and community department staff mentioned earlier about how um, when she's reviewing those septic site applications, she's actually physically looking back at those old plats and seeing if they're plat notes that would identify that you need to have high groundwater here. So Kat, I think that pulls in what you've just said about um, we might have a more engine a, a necessity to do an engineered on-site wastewater treatment system. And so I think we've all hit full circle with um, everything that we've presented today. Gotta love that. I love a full circle moment. All right, we've got a couple more questions here and a few more minutes left in our presentation. Um, so this isn't necessarily septic related, but I'll go ahead and ask it anyway. This is from Robert. Does county notify nearby property owners of new subdivisions and what is the notification radius? Um, I can take that. Unless Craig wants to take that. Go ahead, Carrie. OK, um, so your county staff um, requires an applicant or a developer to notify all adjacent property owners at the time they make a submittal to planning and community development. In addition, your your planning staff, um, we have a great admin support team and they actually send out letters to all of our adjacent property owners next to a development um, and let those folks know that we have a planning commission and a board of county commissioner hearing coming up for that particular subdivision and so that those adjacent property owners can attend virtually, send in a comment letter or attend um, physically. Awesome, thanks Carrie. Um, all right, another question from Mitchell here. Can you speak to what is required for inspections when a home, not new construction, with an OWTS is sold or purchased? Are there any other regular inspections that the county and or state require? Yeah, I'll take that one. So um, what you're referring to is what we call our transfer of title process. Um, any home that is on a OWTS system is required as part of the sale of the property to undergo inspection. Um, those are conducted by our certified inspectors, which we also have a list on our website of. Um, that entails essentially providing an inspection of that system, much like a home inspection. So they are going to um, evaluate what that tank looks like. They should you know, pump the tank and get a good idea of the structural integrity of the tank. They're gonna identify any potential ponding issues, surfacing issues, effluent above operational limits to identify if that system is still in a state of functioning as it was originally designed to do so. Um, we then, that report then gets transmitted to us via application. Uh, we evaluate that system and provide what we call educational disclosure so that we can provide as much information about that system in an educational format for the potential buyer to make an informed decision about the property and what they would like to see changed or um, rectified if there are any items that require that. Um, we will issue, if it's issued on an acceptance document, there are no required actions to that system, even though there may be some items that we would highly encourage to be um, taken care of. Um, otherwise, a conditional acceptance document is issued if there is an action that is required. And that usually results in either a new field being installed, a new tank, or identification of what potentially could have created an issue and whether or not that issue is existing long term. Um, there are as a, a part of the chapter eight regulations in order for us to permit reduced system sizing and setbacks to limiting layers such as groundwater and bedrock or on-site physical features higher level treatment systems that utilize pressure distribution and or in tank in tank treatment units are required to maintain an operation and maintenance maintenance contract with a certified operation and maintenance specialist um, for the life of that system and for the life that they own that system. Um, currently, that process is in development. Um, we will have an amendment to our regulations um, at, and a public hearing to discuss that in May. 
um, and it, it will be on our website. So if you want more information, you can visit that um, early next week. It will be up and, and uh, available for review. And what that's going to do is it's going to create an operation and maintenance permit that's required to be had on all systems that utilize pressure distribution or higher level treatment in tank units. And that permit has to be maintained on an every two year basis and renewed every two years thereafter. Um, the maintenance contract has to remain in place for the length of that permit. If it is canceled, we do require a submission of a new one within 30 days. And those systems are required to have a inspection summary submitted to us once every six months for the first year of operation and then annually thereafter as well. Awesome, thank you, Kat. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? I think that pretty much covers it though. All right, um, that's all we have for questions. So thank you everybody for submitting those. I think those were great. Here, I do want to remind everyone there's a lot of info to take in today. And we know that it's hard to jot things down while you're trying to pay attention. So we will be sending out a link and resources worksheet um, after this presentation. We'll also be posting it on our planning and community development website under the EPC Engage tab, along with a recording of this presentation. So you can go back and watch this if you'd like to. You can also refer this to colleagues or friends who you think might be interested. Um, and it will live on our website um, as part of our EPC Engage library. Um, and we want to make sure everybody has this information when they need it. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Craig to close us out and remind us about our upcoming EPC Engage events in the next few months. Craig. Thanks, Lauren. Well, first off, I just want to thank our partners at uh, El Paso County Public Health uh, and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, so much amazing information. Um, just, just great to hear directly from the source. Um, you know, a lot of times you're, the development community would just interact with the planning department, but it's really important to identify all the, the different partners that go into making good development happen. Um, so really appreciative of, of their time and willingness to, to join us today. Um, and in that vein, obviously, again, coming up in May, we'll be talking about uh, the water supply review process. That also will include uh, the state as well as um, our own county attorney's office, as I mentioned earlier. And then in July, uh, one that I think will will really touch a lot of folks is things that we do at the front counter, those residential site plans and some of the other permits like temporary use permits. Um, really great information. Again, as Lauren said, all this will be available. All the different videos will be available on our website. We'll be out there for for a resource, both for for you all, but also as we train new staff and and interact with new uh, contractors. So, uh, again, we appreciate your your attendance today. Hopefully, this was very helpful for everybody. Um, and if you have additional questions as a follow up, please feel free to send those over uh, either to our staff or to Cat over at Public Health. With that, I think uh, we'll wrap it up. Thank you all.